Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, fly tying group uh, online uh, fly tying uh, technique program that we're uh, running every second and fourth Tuesday of the, of the month until April. Uh, we have volunteer uh, tires that come on and teach us some of their great techniques and uh, help us help us all become better fly tires. Uh, tonight we have Albedi from Boise. Uh, I'm sure that I'll, most of you know Al and uh, and his beautiful bride uh, Gretchen. Uh, the two spend their time at the vice, behind the cameras, at the keyboard, in in the Zoom studio, and on the water. Uh, in their spare time, they enjoy uh, spoiling their four grandkids. That's the best thing in the world. The BDs here have authored uh, 25 books together and are the only husband and wife to have received the uh, Buzz Busick Memorial, Memorial Award for Fly Tying Excellence. Uh, Al is going to be uh, sharing with us uh, uh, hair wing uh, techniques and you're going to be using the uh, gray wolf as his uh, example fly. And with that, Al, it's all yours. Rick, we thank you very much for asking us to join you tonight. And, and when I say us, even though I might be the featured tire tonight, Gretchen will be running the Zoom studio, which is a lot more work than what I'll be doing. But on the flip side, come February, She'll be in the in the hot seat, and I can run the Zoom, the Zoom studio. So we take turns at that kind of stuff. But tonight we're going to be dealing with hair wings. And successfully tying a hair wing um, really is more about picking the right material than it is skills. And if I were to break it down into a percentage, if you have the right material, that's 60% of the battle. The right skills is 40%. And I know many people would probably think differently. But let's take a look at something here. I want you to see where we're headed. This is a gray wolf. This is a gray wolf tied western style. I will tie one tonight. I'll tie it eastern style, which means it's going to be tied sparser. But I want you to just take a look at that. That's just a, a typical western style yeah, thank you, Gretch. Fairly heavy hackle, heavy body, and it's a it, it's made for some rough water. And let me tell you where what we're going to learn tonight. Let me get this out of the way. I want to share something with you. Here's a couple of bodies that I tied earlier today. One on the left, one on the right. The one on the right is the what I would have for an objective as an underbody before I put on the dubbing and the hackle. The one on the right is what often happens to fly tires because they don't have the right material. You can see that there's a bit of a difference here. It's not impossible to tie with the wrong material, but it sure is easier to use the right material as an example, the body that you see on the right, I tied that, uh, oh, about an hour ago, and it, it took me about three minutes. The one on the left, though it looks really terrible, it was a son of a gun to, to deal with the wrong hair, the wrong hair for the job, that is. And it took me about 15 minutes to get this as a terrible-looking mess. Anyway, let's put that roadmap fly back into the vise so that we have something to look at. <clears throat> and let's see, Gretz, let's take a look at the uh, at the script here now and see where are we going next. Tying Technique Series. There's three major considerations. And I want you to notice I got all three listed. I have condition, selection, environment. You notice that selection is in bold. Well, you'll see why here in just a minute. But condition, condition is a really easy thing to deal with. I mean, you either have hair, damaged hair, it's either straight or it's not straight, 
and it's either clean or it's not clean. And that shouldn't be the type of thing you have any difficulty figuring out. And if you buy your material, the hair, from the fly shop, then you should feel pretty confident that it's going to be pretty good in all of these categories. Especially you don't expect it to be dirty and the hair to be damaged like it's been run over by a truck or something like that. But what we want to get into now is the difference between success and failure. And that's the selection. What I want you to see now is we're looking at a picture of a deer hide. I just took it off of the internet, but I've, Gretchen and I have bought many of these deer hides over the, over the years. And I want you to notice that there's a dark strip down the middle. There's white down around the belly area. In fact, most of the belly stuff is, is gone. It's just mostly what we have here is backbone in the rib part of the animal with some darker hair up here in the shoulder neck area. Okay, now listen real careful because this is the key to successfully tying with hair, tying hair wing dry flies. Remember that, hair wing dry flies. Black, dark, dense, doesn't flare. Wings and tails, humpies and wolves. Flares, and you're tying muddlers. Any spun hair fly comes out of this part of the animal. The dark part right here is for the wings and tails. I want you to notice there in, the, in number two, we've got backbone versus rib hair. Okay, we've talked about that. What you're going to find, and I'll show you some here in just a minute, but you're going to find that the dark hair along the backbone will be good for the wings and tails, and you'll notice that the hair going down into the rib gets lighter the farther into the rib area that it goes. What we are looking for is an LDCR of 60% plus or minus. What is that? That's the light to dark color ratio. And this is for a hair wing dry fly. And it's 60%, meaning that about 60% of the fiber of the hair is dark. Let's take a look at, at, a real, at some real chunks of hair here. Here is a piece of hair. And I want you to notice that it's really quite dark up in this area. And as we go down along in the hide, you see it gets lighter and lighter. This is light almost, um, I would say the dark is on the last 20% of the, of the fiber. And the bottom part, which would be 80%, is light in color. That's not good for wings and tails. It's not the wrong, it's the wrong hair for the job, but it's not bad hair. It's almost impossible to tie a spun muddler with this stuff. You must have this stuff for a spun muddler. But let's get back to this right here. And in fact, this is right up close to the backbone. This is a, another piece of hair right next to it from the same hide. I'll just lay that down, get it out of the way. It gets darker and darker and darker until we get further up right smack on the backbone. And I think you can see that it gets almost to the point of being 80% oh, dark. Well, this 60% light to dark color ratio is right in this area here. You can spin some of this stuff down on the base, but you will find that this doesn't flare very much and that's what you want. So let's set this all aside for the moment. I'm gonna take my buddy Paul Fidelis in Port Macquarie, Australia. Uh, that's New South Wales. It's very close to the ocean. And as such, he lives in a fairly humid climate. The same thing with my buddy David Buckner in Mississippi or my friend Jack Gillis in Texas. On the other hand, I live on, on the edge of the Great Basin in, in, uh, in Idaho. The Great Basin covers uh, six states. And uh, it, the definition of the Great Basin is the water that originates in the Great Basin never leaves, it never goes to the ocean. Okay, well, that uh, covers the better part of six states, the central part of the U.S., uh, better known as the West. And going around and out around that is an area even larger that's just as arid, just as deserty. And um, it's, um, well, it's just as dry. The only thing that just changes this distinction from the Great Basin is that it's got water uh, that originates there that ends up in the Pacific Ocean. Enough said on that. One of the things you're going to have to deal with, at least in my part of the world, 
is if there is a dry, arid climate, you will have static electricity and it will drive you crazy. And you'll swear that the hair is just not good. It's bad. It sticks to everything. You can't get it out of your stacker. So it sticks to your hands. It does everything that you don't want it to do. Well, this little product right here, it's called Static Guard. It comes from, in the U.S. here anyway, it comes from uh, the laundry aisle in our supermarkets, right next to the, to the soap. And it's made for taking static electricity out of clothing. Ladies use it a lot to keep the, the clothing from clinging to their body from the static electricity. You won't have to worry about that if you're in Mississippi or Florida or Port Macquarie. But here in the West, you're going you're gonna to need this stuff. Now, let me share a tip with you before we go into actually dealing with the hair. This is a can, a large can of static guard. What I have over the top of it is a dryer sheet. You put these sheets in your dryer to dry the clothes so they come out without wrinkles. It's anti-static. It's some of the best stuff that there is. And I have a sheet of that around a can held with rubber bands. So when I'm getting ready to do some work on hair, I'll just pull the, pull the lid off and spray down the hair and the tools and everything. But every now and then, I'm working along and it starts sticking to my hands and I just do that little routine. And then I just go back to work and all I've done is take any static electricity out of my hands. But I wanna cover one more thing on the selection of, of hair and what, to, and what to do with it before we go into questions or start tying the actual fly. One of the things that we run into often, let me take this fly out for a moment, is crooked hair. Hair that's got a curve to it. And this is hair that if you look at it in the fly shop, in a, in a bin or in a, in a package, you're gonna say, well, that looks pretty straight. Well, I want you to see it from the side. And, and the only way you can see it from, a, from the side is for me to cut a piece off. So I'm going to lay that down over here and cut a piece off of that. And then I'll be back to the vise in just a moment. And I want you to notice the curve in that hair. That hair does not, is not going to want to stack worth a darn. Because it's the, hair, the lining the tips up is really difficult when the tips are going in every direction under the sun. And when I let go of that the base end that I'm holding and get moving into a stacker, what's going to happen is there, those little curves are going to go everywhere. Well, you don't have to put up with that. You can get rid of the curve. And the curve, well, let's, I'll tell you what, we're going to use a technique developed by our brothers and sisters who tie full dress Atlantic salmon flies. And one of the things that go on a full dress Atlantic salmon fly is a golden crest feather over the top, it's called a topping, and the curve is not always perfect for the situation. And so flat salmon fly tires either make the curve more severe, or they straighten out the curve by taking their thumbnail and forefinger and putting a series of crimps in that curve and I'm to take it out or to, on the other side of the curve, to add to it. So I'm just gonna put a series of crimps in there. Now I want you to notice that most of that hair now is straightened out. And there's a couple of wild hairs like that guy and that guy right there that we, uh, eh, there's still a couple of that I need to straighten out there. So I'll straighten them out. All I did is put crimps in there. And in fact, I've over crimped some of them, but it's a lot straighter than it was. So you can straighten the hair up to a point. Now there's one other thing before we leave this, and I'm using this bundle of elk hair because it best illustrates uh, what I'm going to try to share with you now, which is once you've selected the right hair, all hair in a bundle isn't the same. You have to get rid of about more than half of that bundle of hair. Now, the reason that I'm using elk is because it's all an even color. And you'll notice when I start using the deer, it's dark. And uh, the modeling on the, on the deer makes it difficult sometimes to see what you're looking at. You can see this really easy because of the color. It's, it's a consistent color. But one of the things that you do when you're getting ready to tie a fly is you must get rid of the junk and keep the part that's gonna have the properties that you want, okay? Simple, without a whole lot of explanation, 
what you want to use for your wings and tails is layers one and two. So what is layers one and two? Well, layer one is this longest stuff right here. I'm holding it to my finger right now. And that stuff sticking up right there, that's layer two. So let's get a hold of layer number two now. Now, layers number one and two, I have all that other stuff and all this garbage has to go away. You have to get rid of it. And I'll explain how I'm going to get rid of it later. But you want to get rid of it without uh, causing a lot of static electricity. Anyway, but that has to go away. And the reason this hair down here, number three, you're going to see a lot of number three hair. And so, dang, that looks just like number one and number two. The only difference is, is it's a, at a different stage of maturity in the animal. And its characteristics under the tension of thread will be very different. Okay, so let me just throw this away now. So now we're going to get down to actually tying a fly. The gray wolf. We're going to be using dry fly hooks. Thread's going to be gray or it's whatever color you want it to be because remember, this is the gray wolf, but the wolves are tied in a whole series of colors. And all you want to do is just change your thread to go with it. The tail's going to be deer hair. I'm using white tail deer. And I'll, and I'll explain to you right now. I only use white tail deer on any of my fly tying excursions, period. And why is that? Not that the other hair is bad. It's because I want to provide a consistent product to my customers, the same that I did 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Always, I always select white tail deer and I select it for certain color properties that I expect so that I will always be providing a consistent fly. For those of you who are going to your fly shop and you're tying for yourself and your buddies, you don't need to worry about that. Not at all. You don't need to worry about it. Anyway, uh, wings, deer, body, dubbing, or whatever color you want, grizzly, gun hackle, or choice, and thread for the head. Now let's come back here to, to us. And we've got some questions. And so Gretchen, tell me what they say there. Okay, this first question is from John Wright, and he says, for a new fly tire trying to find the hair from the back while in a fly shop is a challenge. How does a new beginner fly tire pick the right material from the bunch of pieces hanging on a board? How does he or she know if a piece of hair is darker than another piece, if the piece has no difference, says, and all the pieces are the same? How does he or she know what's darker? And, you know, I was lucky I had you selecting my hair. So, uh, it, uh, in fact, let's go back and take a look at that picture for a minute. Go to the, go to the materials camera, Gretch. That is a very, very valid c concern, John. Looking at that picture, we know that if I am a supplier that cuts up hair and puts it in packages to hang on a wall, and I cut this complete hide up, that 20%, roughly, of the hair that goes up on the wall will be the stuff you want for wings and tails, and the other 80% will be for a very good purpose. I mean, spinning on a hook, but it won't be worth a darn for wing and tail hair. I don't have an answer for you, other than you're going to have to find something that looks more like this and less like this. And if it's all light colored, clear down in the belly, it's a problem. And again, I don't have the answer. I only can tell you what you have to look for. You'll have to find your source. And this, the source could very well be, okay, there's a gentleman that's working with Project Healing Waters in Omaha right now. And I uh, would really recommend that you uh, get a chance to join them sometime. His name is Josh Farner, and he is a supplier to Charlie's Fly Shop and to um, Kelly Gallup's two shops in Montana. And one of the things about Josh Varner is uh, he's, a, he's a veteran. He's uh, got two more years before he can retire from the service. Good guy. And he's starting a business in hair. And what I've seen of his hair so far, it's phenomenal. But, John, to answer your question, I can't. Sourcing the, the, the perfect stuff is the only thing mm -hmm. I could... You can order from Charlie and you can from order from Charlie and from uh, Charlie's Fly Box or from Kelly Gallup. They'll do a pretty good job of selecting for you, probably better than you will do. Um, 
by yourself the first time out. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Now, the other thing is uh, earliest late season hair properties. Okay. One of the things about uh, early and late season, early season, the the fuzzy stuff right down at the base of the hair, uh, I call it the duff. I don't know whether it's the proper name for it or not, but anyway, it's a... Uh, Anyway, it's uh, the stuff that uh, makes the animal warm. Well, in, the, in, in the early season, an animal harvested in the early fall, that's going to be much less than an animal harvested uh, getting close to winter. Is there and, less air in the hair, or is it all of the same property? No, the you still have the properties out on the end of the hair that's, that's dense and dark and doesn't flare. Uh, but there's a lot more hair on the animal that's hollow and provides insulation. And when it's hollow, it spins really well, but it isn't good for wing and tails. Good idea. Very good. You know, and another option is uh, a taxidermist. And one of the things that taxidermist is normally working on is on a mounting of, of the neck and the head and the antlers. Okay. So, um, well, there's going to be a lot of... What the, what the taxidermist asks the hunter to do is to bring lots of extra hide that comes in from around there. So what I'm saying is there's a lot of dark trimmings that are going to be trimmed off of that that are close to the backbone. And I never did talk about the shoulder and neck hair, which also is very good for wings and tails. So that's another source that you can go to a taxidermist and tell him you're looking for white-tailed deer and the dark stuff that comes from the backbone. And shoot, they don't even have a hide laying around. You never know. It's, uh, but that, that could be another source for you. Anyway, I've already got my hooks uh, selected and put into a clip so that I can I can pick them up easily without struggling. I've had people ask me a lot. You notice my hook is kind of heading uphill. Good. I do. I've I've done that forever since uh, since I was a kid learning to tie. I can't tell you why. I just did, and I always have. And I like my my hook slightly heading uphill. Drives me crazy. I do. Okay, Gretchen. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, that's one of the places where we don't agree. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to start my thread at a position about one-third back on the hook shank from the front of the hook. I'm going to wrap to the bend and back. And one of the things I want you to notice is when I get wrapped up to this point here, i got to go around that hook point. And i got to do that little routine. Or what I can do is my hand is holding this straight up and down. But if I raise my elbow, you can see my hand going up. And what that does is allows me to wrap at an angle to see that I'm wrapping straight back into there without having to go zip, 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 and all that stuff going around the hook point. Doesn't mean I never go around the hook point, but that's just a way of getting it back in there. And it may be worth something to you, and it may, it may be a waste of time. But let's slip over to the... Let's slip over to the um, materials area. And the first thing I want to do is I've got some sized hackle already taken out. We're not even going to talk about sizing hackle. That's for techniques on and someone else will be dealing with that. What I'm dealing with right now is hair. And I'm just going to cut out a bundle of hair and clean the waste out of it. And I'm going to go straight from here to the vise and we'll talk about the waste and all that for a moment. And I have just a little bit of curve in this, not much. So I'm going to put a couple of crimps in that. Notice that I put the crimps in before I clean it. There, that straightens it out pretty good. Now I've got layers one and two here. And I wanted, want you to see all the modeled effect from the tan and the black and everything. It's more difficult to see which is which. I can see it pretty good here because I got glasses special for it that are magnifiers. But over the camera, that's pretty tough. But anyway... That's layers one and two that I've got held right there. And I'm going to get rid of this now. And I'm going to move my finger up and down through the butt ends just like that. And what that does is that knocks the, the crud loose and all the shorties without creating more static electricity. Now, I don't want to do that in front of my camera here because I want to have fuzz all over the lens. So I'm going to move over to my waste bin and clean that all out. And we'll come back, put it in here, and now the crud's gone. 
one of the things that I, I wanted to warn you about, what you don't want to do to get rid of the waste and under fur and everything is start stroking, trying to stroke it out. Because every time you stroke that, you're, ri you're ri lining those little electrons up. And once those electrons get all lined up, uh, you're going to have uh, static electricity. So, but when you do this routine, you're, you're continually changing directions and that doesn't create more static electricity. Now, we're going to use put this into my hair stacker. And for those of you joining us for the first time, that's a homemade hair stacker. I've got 24 of them. I made them 40 years ago, and they are not for sale. I can't tell you how many times I've had people <laughs> trying to buy the darn things from me. They are not for sale. If you want one of your own, get a shotgun shell, a half-inch copper nipple, and a chapstick tube. There you are. Anyway, so now we're going to pull the, the hair out of the stacker. And we want to talk about how much hair goes into the, into the tail. Well, that's kind of an arbitrary amount. But one of the things that I really recommend is you pick an arbitrary amount that you like, that looks good to you, and then stick with it. The one that we've developed is goes like this. What you do is you take that stack bundle of hair in this area right here, which is going to become the tail, that dark stuff. I am going to take and give it a one hand twist, just like that. And you can see that now I've got a, a twisted bundle of hair with a circumference. And what I want is a bundle of hair with a circumference that's pretty close to equal to the outside circumference. Of the of the hook eye, well, that's way too much there. So what I'm going to do is take a look down here and get rid of a bunch of this hair. And one of the things after you do this for a while, you don't have to do that twist over routine. But when you're getting started, now there, that's getting a little bit a little bit better. Get my hand out of the way so you can see, and that's a lot closer to what I'm looking for. But I still need to get rid of a couple. And that's and that's it. Yep. Thank you, Gretch. That good. That close up did did good. So now I'm going to measure that tail for length equal to the length of the hook shank, and I'm going to set it in place and get ready to tie it. Now here's a place you get into trouble. What I'm going to demonstrate to you right here is a place where you're going to go to tie your tail on. You're going to get in trouble. Well, first off, we want to tie the tail on with really strong, tight anchor wraps. And then as we get towards the end of the shank, relax those wraps a little bit so that we can control the hair flare. Well, here's what happens when you put this under a tight wrap. It's going to be a son of a gun to continue tying without snagging some of that and causing you a problem. Well, let's back off. I'll show you a little trick. I'm going to move this here. Now I'm going to remeasure my tail for the proper length set it in place, and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach this with snug, just gentle wraps, all right? And now I'm going to wrap back a couple of turns right about to there, and this is where I really get into it. See that? Tighten up, boy. And had I not put those gentle wraps in there, that would have flared back and just been very difficult to work around. So tight. 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 Now I'm going to start relaxing those wraps a little bit so that I don't flare that hair. See, I want that hair to stay together. Now I'm going to trim out the waist. Now this is an, an important feature because it's going to determine how good the body looks after we put the wings on. We're going to see how I'm pulling that up straight, cut it off. And I cut it from the off side with my scissors flat along the shank. Whew, got lucky there. I just nicked this red. <laughs> oh, sometimes, you know, it's better to be lucky than good people. Okay, well, anyway, I want you to notice how the, 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 the tapers down quickly here. All right, well, that's, uh, we're going to use that as a way of smoothing out the body when we put on the wings. So let's go to the materials area. 
and get our bundle of hair for the wings. And I'll just tell you right now, I'm going to pick up the process now, or the speed. I'm going to speed up the process a little bit because you already know how to get get the uh, fuzz and stuff out of it. All I got to do is take the crimp, crimp this a little bit to straighten it out. Yep, now it's nice and straight. And how much of it do you want? I'm, I want twice as much, and that's a guesstimation. And that's all I can tell you is you just need to have two wing wing bundles that are the same size each as the tail. That balances the fly so it aerodynamically lands on the water right. I got all the fuzz out of there. And what I'm going to do is just go ahead and stack this. And then I'll make a guesstimation as to how much is double. I want you to notice, I see people make this mistake all the time, that they always turn their hair stacker in the same direction and take the hair out with the tips pointing in the same direction. And now when I pull those out, they're supposed to be the wings. They got to be facing the other way. I've got to turn them around in my fingers and hope that they don't get misaligned. Well, the hair stacker swings both ways. I'll just take the, the fibers out pointing in the other direction. Now I know that's overly simplistic, but I see that mistake uh, at fly tying events more than you will believe. Now, that's obviously more than double. And my guesstimation is that I need to get rid of about that amount right there. Now, that's closer to double. And so now I'm getting ready to tie my wing on. And I want the wing to be equal to the length of the shank. And this is one area where I, I've been tying for more than 65 years. I still have trouble making these wings too darn short. So what I do is I end up, I've found a way to keep from having that problem. As I tie them on the side of the hook, it's gentle wraps, longer than they need to be. And then I take a spare hook and verify the length. Okay, that's a little bit long. Let me pull on that a little bit. I pulled on that a little bit. And there, that's um, that's about the shank of the of the hook. So now what I do is when I tighten, and it's on the side there, I use thread torque to roll that up on top of the hook. All right. Now it's time to trim away the waist. Remember that kind of a curved spot that I had at the base end of the tail where the waist came out? Well, I am going to take my scissors flat along the shank, pull that hair back at about a 45 degree angle and give it a cut. Now, when I wrap my thread over those waist ends, they're going to blend right into the little belly left from the waist of the tail. Now, that's the second time I got lucky tonight, people. So you're seeing one awful lucky guy here or things are going to really go to heck on me here in a bit. I just was watching. I was looking up at the screen to see what, what was going on there, What I should have been watching what I'm doing. I mean, come on, you know. And uh, anyway, I just about broke the thread. Okay, now I've got a um, hair fibers that are coming down on the underside of the hook. See that one crossing over there? Well, I don't want that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap my, hair, my thread back so that it's hanging kind of at the base of the hill in that, in that valley kind of an area. Because I, I need a place where I can get a good pull on the thread coming forward like this and ha ha have it fairly parallel to the hook shank. And so, because what I want to do now is to come between the wing and the shank and then go back to that anchor point with a loop of thread. And what that does is puts my hair up on top except for that one fiber, and I'm not going to worry about it. But what that does is gets the rest of the bundle up on top. Now, well, let's wrap forward to the back of the, of the wing assembly. Now, here's the next place where you get into trouble with your, with your wolves. And that is when you go to stand up the hair. Most people pull the bundle of, of hair up, and they wrap a thread dam in front of those wings uh, and push it up and 
it'll be setting up about like that. Looks good. The thread dam is holding it there. They finish the fly, put it in their box, and when they open up the box a few weeks later to go fishing, all the wings have tilted forward in their box. Show you how to avoid that. And this trick that I'm going to share with you right now is really great if you're tying comparadons. <clears throat> all right. What you do is you don't try to stand the whole bundle up at once. You do it uh, a few at a time. Let's start about a third. And let's just run a thread down through there. You see how it stands that one up? All right. Now let's go to the next one. Stand that up. And now we're going to wrap our thread dam in front. And the only thing the thread dam is holding up right now is that last third of the bundle because the others are held in place by their own miniature thread dam, if you will. And now what I want you to notice is how straight up and down those are, and they're going to stay that way. All right, so <clears throat> now it's time to divide these. And uh, that looks about, looks about right to you, Gretch. Yeah. One of the things that... I find that I have an awful time with the camera setting between me and my work. I don't get to get to look at the fly the same way I do when I'm tying flies without a camera. So I look up on the screen to see how it looks. It does look pretty good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cross between those two bundles. And now I'm going to set up to, to tie the fly, the wing on the opposite side. And I'll just take several turns of thread around that wing post. There we go. And I'm going to take and bring that from the top of the post, bring it down around the hook shank, going backwards around the shank now. A couple of turns. Now I'm going to come back through that bundle of hair and wrap as post here. And I'm going to take my, my thread and go back to the shank again, going in the proper direction for a right-handed tire. And what I just did there is I basically built a miniature, let's see if I can get it here. Here we go. What I did is I built a miniature tent pole with a downward angled thread anchored to the ground, if you will. Now, that may not be showing up real well, but that's what we, what we try to do so, so that it also helps keep those, that hair up straight. Okay, now it's time to finish the fly, and I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit because you don't need to know how to dub for me. You had a good uh, presentation on dubbing here a couple of weeks ago from uh, Mike Kelly, but I will get back over here to the to the materials and grab my dubbing and my, my dubbing wax and come back over here to the fly. <clears throat> and I'll just get my dubbing out of the packet. Set that on the side right there. Open my dubbing wax. I want you to notice that I'm turning the lid up like this and setting it down. And I'll explain to you why here in just a minute. But for right now, what I want to do is just put some wax on my thread. Okay, now I'm going straight, I'm taking this straight down into the lid, picking it, keeping the lid on. I cannot tell you how many times I have dropped my dubbing wax into the waste bin without the cap on, and trust me, that makes a mess. We'll just leave it at that. And what I'm doing now is a touch dubbing my dubbing to the wax thread. You see how that's just, it just grabs the dubbing out of the bundle of, of dubbing. And what I'm going to do now is twist it in, in a clockwise direction. And I'll just start placing <clears throat> dubbing on the fly. Oh, 
One other thing you notice, I want you to notice that I'm switching back and forth here, um, looking at the other side. How many times have you tied a nice looking fly and then you uh, you get to the very end and dang, you missed a spot on the other side. The fly is already done. Well, keep looking at the other side so that you know what's going on there. I need just a tiny, tiny bit more dubby. So I'm just going to pull just a smidgen off. And put it on a thread. There we go. And let me get my hackle up here. I've just I've got a got the two hackles, uh, one extra just in case uh, I lose one or drop it on the floor or whatever. Yeah, that's about the right size. It's a grizzly. I want you to notice that when I tie my stem on. I want some bare stem sticking up above the hook shank so that I don't end up with fiber sticking out back over the, uh, the dub body. All right. <clears throat> and we'll just... Um, I'll show you how to screw up a fly. I've got two turns of thread there anchoring that feather in place. And uh, you think to yourself when you're tying the fly, you said, boy, Al, I tied a pretty nice looking fly there. I sure don't want that feather to come apart, come off, come loose. I better put a couple more turns of thread on there to anchor that feather. So I go three, six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 16, 18, 20. Boy, 20 turns ought to hold it. It won't come apart now. So then I have to, Cut off the feather, and I cut off the feather, and oh, I got to cover that up. So you have to wrap and cover up that cut off end, and darn, you've just got a beautiful fly with a big lopsided head on it. Well, let me back up here to right there. That's two turns right there. We're going to show you how to uh, to dog leg your hackle, and what we do when we dog leg the hackle is I already have the thread coming across the feather like that. What I'm going to do is my next turns now are going to be in front of that feather, pushing all that back and building a thread head and jam knot at the same time. Now, sometimes it's tough to get all that those fibers to go back the way you want them. Well, you can use your half hitch tool to do that. And this is a trip tip that came to me from Jan Aben in the Netherlands uh, earlier this year. And I've just used it like crazy ever since is what you do is you just take and put a half hitch, push it up against those feathers. Whoops, too much. You see how that pushed those back? Now, I will take my fingers and pull them back and wrap that thread head, which is also a jam knot, forcing that hackle back. Now, you see how that hackle kicks back there? And I've got a nice thread head. And I'm uh, going to use my whip finish tool. And I'm going to put on a good whip finish. And then we're going to talk about the difference between a good and a bad whip finish. The good whip finish starts at the back of the head. And each turn gets closer to the hook eye. That's a four-turn whip. We'll just call that good right there. Tighten that up. Hang that up over there. Trim off the waist of the feather. And let me just make sure that everything is the way I want it. I'll look my way around the, the fly. And there's a gray wolf. If there's no questions, then what I'm going to do is talk to you for a moment about a good whip finish and a bad whip finish. Heavy piece of floss. I'll just tie that on here. We're going to make a pretend fly. Okay, that's a pretend fly. And what I'm going to do now is wrap my pretend fly like most people do. You get through putting the hackle and all this kind of stuff on. Okay, And what they do is they bring the thread all the way forward to the hook eye. They start the first turn at the hook eye. And then they make the next turn 
a little bit further back, next a little bit further back. And that looks pretty good. And then they get ready and they start to cinch it up. And I want you to notice something as it's cinching up. I want you to notice where that strand of thread is going. It's going over the top of the knot before it goes through the knot. Where do you think the weak point is? Well, I'm going to show you the proper way now to do a whip finish. The whip finish should start at the back of the head and each turn advances closer to the hook eye. So let's start. At the back of the at the back of the head, each turn is going to get closer to the hook eye. Now, I'm just going to pull this down, and I want you to notice nothing laying across the knot there. It just all disappears under the turns of thread. I have another option for you, and we're coming up right now on a, this is not going to be a complete fly. It's a method of controlling bulk. And that's what we're going to be talking about next. Now I'm going to again start my thread right at the uh, about the one-third point, give or take. And But I only wrap it halfway back because I'm going to do something you don't often see people doing. I'm going to have a hackle fiber tail with a hair wing. And what I'm going to do is I've got a, a bundle of these great whiting tailing feathers and uh well i've i've got a long one right here i'll just uh, take some from this guy right here i'm not going to worry about color or anything like that we're just showing you techniques right now i'll just move off camera so i can control that feather and get a few of those fibers out and i want you to notice that when i put on a hackle fiber tail that the bulk of that is very much less than the ha the hair tail i put on the last fly well, that's, that's, we're going to talk about how we can kind of smooth all that out now. A hackle fiber tail tends to be longer than a hair tail. So I'll I'll make it about, oh, one and one half times the length of the hook shank, give or take. And we're not going to worry about how much it's, how long or short it is. We're just going to talk about a whole other thing, and that is blending a, a real skinny hackle fiber tail waist on the fly if you will to the bulk that's going to be in the wings the shoulders of the fly but i'm going to go back over here to the materials and i'm going to get a bundle of hair that's about half the size of what i would normally do for wings and, but i'm going to go through all the same stuff that i normally do uh, i'm going to Straighten that out because it's got a little bit of a curve to it. There, that straightened it out good. And I'm going to get out over here in my waist bin and get rid of the waist. Now remember, I'm going to, I want to have a bundle of hair that's about half the the volume that I had in the other one. It's because remember it was the the hair tail was a certain size, and then the um, the hair tail was a certain size and the wing bundle was twice the size. Okay, well, we still need to have a wing that's fairly substantial because we're using hair. But we have just this little old skinny tail back here. So what I'm going to do now is pull these fibers out here. <clears throat> Okay, and I'm starting to have a problem right now. I'm going to put these right back in the stacker. You see that air on the stacker? It's sticking to the stacker. I've got some sticking all over my hands. It's just becoming a problem. It's hanging off of my hands. And What I'm going to do now is set my scissors down for a moment, and I'm just going to grab that. Because if I spray this stuff, it's kind of wet, and uh, it takes a while for it to dry out and be just static protection rather than having too much wetness on my hands. So now that should take care of all that static for a moment. And we'll go back to the vise. Oh. oh, yes. You guys that live in that humid country, you don't know how good you got it when it comes to tying with hair anyway. Anyway, so I, what I'm going to do now is start with a half-size half bundle for my wing. 
And I'm going to set it in place there, just like I did before. Rotate it into position. And then try to blend the waist from the wing and the tail so that there is a smooth transition between the shoulders and the waist. Nice taper there. All right. Now, we want to stand this up, and I'll just, I only need to stand it up in a couple of bundles. I'll just, one bundle there, one bundle there, and we'll wrap a small thread down there and stop. Well, I need just a little bit more hair in that wing. So let me get back over to the, to my uh, materials, and I'll just get another piece of hair here. <clears throat> And uh, again, I'm just going to, yep, it needs to be straightened out. Yep, that straightens it out. Back over to the waist bin. All right. And now that's, now it's pretty, it's pretty clean. And I'll stack that. And I'm going to, my, my wings normally would be pointing forward, but it's not going to happen that way this time. I'm going to have this pointing back. You'll see why here in just a minute. Because I want a, a fuller wing than the one I've got right now, but I don't want a big bulky body back there. So what I'm going to do is put this, this part of the wing on front. Just like that. See how that's sitting right there? But what I'm going to do is pull that thread over here out of the way. And I'm going to cut that off even with the bottom of the hook. Now I'm going to bring the thread back around, move it into place, wrap, it, wrap a couple of turns there. Trim off any waist ones there that I don't want to have around the hook eye. So I've got half of the bulk of my wing in front and half behind. Therefore, I have a skinny body to match the tail, but I still have the wings there that I need. Now, I can do one of two things. I can divide that just like I did on the last one. Or we can call this one a comparadun. Because I wanted to show you something about dubbing. I will share you a little bit about dubbing. I want, I want you to first notice that I did not fan that all the way across yet. We'll, we'll fan that all the way across here in a minute. But not now. Right now we just want to put some dubbing on the hook. And I'll get my wax out. Remember, I'm going to turn the cap up. So that it's waiting there. I can just turn this over upside down and put it right down into the cap. Rather than take a chance of ending up in the trash. All right, now we've got a, a nice bundle of dubbing noodle here on the thread. And I'm going to start wrapping from the front, going towards the back. And I've got a hair here that's decided to be wild on me, and that's what scissors are for. You thought I had a special way of... of dealing with that, and I don't. And I'm just working my way from the front, working my way towards the back of the hook. And I've got way too much dubbing here, and that's okay. I'll just take some of it off, get rid of it. Give this a couple of twists. And what I want you to notice, though, that is I'm going to run out of dubbing just as I get to the back of the fly. This fly is going to have a, a rib on it. Let's say that, just for the, for fun's sake, that we were tying a comparadun that's going to be a green drake. Well, I would have tied this then with the yellow thread, put on green dubbing, 
And now when I get to the back, I'll just rib forward with the thread, creating the rib body that I wanted until I get to the front. And what you end up there with is a rib fly. And you can do it so fast, you just can't believe it. Now, that's a commercial tires trick that I'm sharing with you. A, a way of getting a rib on a, a body and uh, getting a, a rib on the on the body, doing it fast. And you notice that look that shows up good there. It really shows up good if you have a contrasting thread. And you can, that's up to you to, de, to decide to use the contrasting thread compared to the material you're using for the dubbing or whatever. But anyhow, I want to show you something else about whip finishes. Now, here is a whip finish tool, and I'm just going to put on a half inch. You see that slides off right there. Now, I'm going to use the same tool to put on a whip finish. And you do that by putting more than one turn on the tool. Okay, it's not sliding very good. That's because there's a lot of friction here on the, on the tool. I'm going to show you one trick that I hadn't planned on showing you, and that is to take my bodkin on my nose. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be so gross. Just so I can make that slippery again. Now I'm going to wrap around that three times. Now I want you to notice that I let that collapse as it comes off, and it's a whip finish. If I pull that off of that half-hitch tool under tension, I end up not with, a, not with a whip finish. I end up with a three-turn jam nut up against a, a half hitch. So you have to let it collapse as it goes on, and you'll end up with a whip finish every time. And it's a fast way to do it. That's especially handy when you're working with parachutes. But anyhow, do we have any questions? You want to explain that about the thread magic? Oh, boy, yeah. I, I should have. I've been using it all along, and I forgot to do that. It's just, you know, with all the people that share tricks with us, uh, and we've been writing a tips and tricks column for Fly Terror Magazine for 20 years, and I would say at least 60% uh, of those tips come from other people, and we give them credit. I mean, Jesus, that's, it doesn't hurt us any to give them credit for sharing these things with us. And Jim Ferguson and Kathy Hamilton shared this one with us. And let me get this thread magic stuff out. And we'll go to the to the to the vice. This is it. Thread magic. You get it at Amazon. Okay. I'll just pull the cap off. And this stuff lasts forever. It's just it's it's amazing. Anyway, that's just kind of a hard piece of wax that you rub it over your fingers. And what it does is it takes all of those cracks and valleys. You can see I got them all over my hand. Well, before I put that on earlier today, those cracks snagged the thread every single time it went through. I've been out shoveling snow and, and doing some work uh, in the yard, and that causes all those cracks. Well, those cracks are now filled with this just wonderful slippery stuff that makes it so easy to tie flies without having your, your, your fingers snagging the thread. Now, for you fellows that are office workers and never have to do anything outside, good. Um, I came from a ranching environment where you're working outside all the time, and it's where just about everything on a farm or, or a ranch is, uh, it, it doesn't treat your hands good. But anyhow. Okay. It's, how do you flare the hair and keep it where you want it? Mm, good. We're going to do that next. You're okay. a mind reader. It will give you an idea of how to spin hair successfully. And I am going to, <clears throat> let's see, I'm going to take this gray thread. I want you to notice something that I do with my thread. You notice that rubber O-ring on the, on the bobbin? Well, that's there so that I can pull it off, slip it over. Down and, lower. Slip it over and capture the thread so that the thread doesn't come un, undone. This is especially helpful when you're traveling to shows. There's something about getting on an airplane or driving a car that makes all the thread on all the spools and on all your bobbins come undone. And by the time you get to the place where you're going, the first thing you got to do is rethread all the bobbin holders. Anyway, I am going to get a 
Oh, some black thread here, just for the heck of it. <clears throat> We're going to talk about spinning hair like people normally do. And then we'll, we're going to show you an, a way to, uh, it's almost foolproof way to spin hair. Let's see. Now what I need to do is go over here to the materials, and I don't want this stuff because it don't spin worth a darn. All of a sudden, we've gone into a whole new realm, and this great wig and tail material will actually just drive you nuts if you're trying to spin it. This isn't any good either. It said, oh, if I, I was to try to spin this down here, it would spin okay. But as it goes up the hair, it's not so good. So what I'm going to do is go to this bundle. You can see that I've demonstrated spinning a few times. And one of the things about spinning is it usually takes more hair in the spinning process than it does for just tying on the hook to do whatever you want it to do. But anyhow, I'll uh, get a bundle of this hair. Let's see here. <clears throat> Right about there. That's That looks like it's about 40% dark, 60% light. All right, now move over and get the waist. And I don't care about layers one, two, and three. I want to keep all the hair. I just want to get rid of the fuzzies right along the, the, bit, the bottom end. That's all I want to get rid of. The rest of it, all the hair spins fine when it's light color, whether it's layers one and two or three and four or whatever. <clears throat> now I'm going to show you that in spinning hair, when you spin it by hand, and what I mean by hand is by moving your hand around the hook, it's like that, and you spin the hair, that if you want it to be evenly distributed around the hook, you must have, let me move forward just a bit here, you must have even tension on the thread as it goes around the hook, and spreads that hair around the hook this, during the spinning process. So I am going to two, three turns. Now they're just snug turns, kind of holding that in place. I want to cut this and get it out of the way. Now I'm going to start to increase pressure. And as I go around, I'm keeping the pressure constant and even as I go around the hook. And it will tighten up to the point where it can't turn anymore. And now you just keep it under tension, working your way forward through those butt ends. And I think you can see that hair stop spinning. And it stops moving when you have worked your way all the way through and down to the, the hook shank. Now, here's where folks get into trouble is that even tension because if even though they think it is that even though they think that their tension is even as they go around then they'll look at the bundle of hair on the on the hook and it will have weak spots now that's a nicely spun bundle of hair all the way around but it sometimes let's say it looked like that not uncommon for someone to have their their hair all oh darn i got a weak spot there wow well, that's because you didn't didn't have even pressure on your thread as you went around the hook. There's a way. Don't despair. Let's get over here and get another bundle of hair. Get out over the waist bin and get rid of the, the fuzzies. We'll keep layers one, two, three, and four. It's a little bit more than I want. The bigger the bundle of hair, the better it spins. Uh, also, the longer it takes for it to get anchored to the hook shank. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do that I didn't before is I, I set that right in line with the hook shank. I'm going to set this at a 45 degree angle across the hook shank, give or take. One, two, three turns and snug it up slightly. Trim the waist. Now, I've got a bobbin here that's out of sight. Maybe you can go to the offside camera. Okay, my bobbin is right down here and the spool is in the bobbin holder. And I'm going to hold that so that it can't turn. But it, so that when I 
I'll lay my scissors down because it's real easy to cut your thread. I am going to hold this tight. And as I rotate my vise, it's going to gradually shorten that thread or that, that thread and spin the hair itself. Now watch carefully. It's starting to spin. One, and I'm I'm been pinching the, the spool so it don't so it won't turn. It just spun right into place there. Come forward in front. Push it back. With your thumbnail and forefinger. And let's do that again. Just but I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit this time. And I'll stop just stop on my way to the waist to at the waist bin here and, and get rid of that the fluff and then I'll get over here. <clears throat> now you already know what I'm doing. Two, three, cut, grab and hold, rotate the vise. Done. I kept that in my hand the whole time because that's my next bundle of hair. And we'll put that in place, right? I get one. Two, three, cut, hold, steady, turn, done. And there we've got a, a spun uh, application. Take a look at the end of it. Oh, yeah. There you go. All right, now I'm going to just tie this off. And I hadn't planned on this, but I'm going to do it now because I've got a couple of minutes time. You have four minutes. Four <laughs> minutes, good. Thank you, dear. I am going to trim a goddard caddis. I mean, it's a big, right now it's a big wad of, of hair. Then I'll, I'll trim the goddard caddis. I'll just trim flat along the bottom. Now, the Goddard caddis tapers, it's from narrow here and wide towards the back. And so what I'm going to do is use the rotating feature of my vise. Now, I could trim it up and make it a lot prettier, but there's the Goddard caddis. I need to do that routine right there. And right there. And there we have a rough goddard caddis. How you make that look so easy. Uh, it is after you've done several thousand. But Henry wants to know what um, brand of scissors you're using. I am using wrist clips. Amazon, they're about eight bucks, I think, something like that. I don't know. Not, they're not terribly expensive. All right, thank you, Alan Gretchen. That was that was very informative, and I don't know about anybody else, but I learned a lot. Like I said, I've been doing this a long time. Anyway, uh, awesome session. Our next session is January 9th, and our good friend Dutch Bachman uh, will be be our volunteer uh, instructor. He'll be doing pots and grant weaves with the emphasis on the sandy mite. And he'll talk a little bit about the, the history of those uh, particular weaves and those flies and how they came all about. And uh, I've seen part of this presentation. It's excellent. And it's something that really I enjoy very much. And uh, I'm, I know anybody that hears it and watches him. You are, you're going to be impressed. He's got some real skills. So I invite you all. I invite uh, you to invite others. Uh, this is open to anybody. And uh, we appreciate your participation. Uh, we feel very strongly that techniques are a major part of fly tying without our techniques. Uh, you, you, you never will be the fly tire that you want to be. So 
Uh, thank you so much again, Alan and Gretchen. Uh, it was a great, great session.